Good morning, Professor Porter. Good afternoon, Frank. Uh, good morning, actually, still. Um, I'm on the wrong time zone. Right. Um, the uh, most interesting thing that I've noticed in uh, the last uh, week is something that I heard only to begin with yesterday, um, which is uh, something that's been happening in India. Um, India, of course, is a very important country for any consideration of globalization because it's uh, out of a world population of uh, less than 8 billion, it's one and a half billion almost, and it's uh, reached that size only in the last 50 years. Um, and it's also interesting because um, if it wasn't for the British and the colonial period, mm -hmm. it almost certainly would be one country. Uh, it's true that what the, what the British had is now th three countries, if not four countries, or more. Um, but uh, India is by far the largest, and there was no precedent for such a large political unification of uh, the territory in South Asia before the British. Um, and then, of course, when the British left, um, the Muslims wanted a separate country. But uh, in fact, they, not all the Muslims joined the separate country, so that India is still uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, Muslim country in the world, which is, is um, rather, what should I say, um, it, it uh, produces a, a, a situation which is politically interesting. To say um, the least. Uh, anyway, what's happened recently is that the uh, uh, after 50 years or so of a very civilized Indian government uh, by the Congress party, who are the descendants of the people, political descendants of the people who organized the uh, move to independence, uh, Gandhi and Nehru and so on, um, the uh, Hindu party and the Hindutva movement, the movement to uh, use Hinduism politically um, has taken over, which again is interesting because the whole idea of Hinduism as a single religion was British. Uh, it, uh, before the British um, uh, unified the subcontinent, um, there was no sense of, 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 of every part of um, the country that wasn't Muslim. Uh, being uh, actually the same religion, because there's an enormous amount of variation in different mm -hmm. types of Hinduism. Um, and of course, uh, before the British, for uh, several centuries before the British, the governments of India had been Muslim, even though uh, only a minority of the population of India had converted to Islam. So it's an, a very complicated situation. But this move to uh, Hinduize, if I can coin a word, uh, the uh, political structure and uh, also the political ideology of government in India has been intensifying recently. And Modi's election, I think three years ago, right. is, is another move in that direction. And what happened uh, just recently is that uh, the new president of the country, which is basically a symbolic position, but simply because of its symbolism is significant, uh, is a supporter of, of Modi, uh, and similarly uh, a, uh, a fairly aggressive promoter of the Hindu ideological position on India. Um, now, that, this is, um, has drawn attention to the whole thing, and uh, various writers, uh, and there's some very good writers in England, in India, and very uh, good um, magazines that, that discuss these things, and, and so far at least the discussion is totally free in India, um, is uh, pointing all this out and showing that um, gradually the, um, the, the, uh, the possibility of of, of, a, of a secular state, which is um, uh, free for all minorities and not doesn't prejudice one group against another group in any way, is disappearing. 
which completely changes the political and cultural character of India. Now, why is this? What's this got to do with globalization? Well, the um, um, we've talked about identity problems before, and the fact that as the numbers of people continue to increase, uh, the old identities don't work anymore, and gradually more and more people uh, uh, are not quite sure where they fit into society. And um, I think that an, an, an increasing number of countries are, are um, uh, moving towards policies like this that intensify their sense of their national identity. And after all, the whole idea of national identity is fake. Um, <laughs> we, we began it in Europe and then we imposed it on the rest of the world. Um, uh, finally, uh, on all the rest of the world uh, 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 in 1945 with the development of the United Nations. And in fact, there's no country anywhere in the world where, which is, which is uh, populated entirely by people of a single national uh, uh, descent in some way. Um, so, uh, but it did do a lot for identity at the time, and gradually that sense of identity, of being part of a nation which has a place in the world, it, uh, is a much simpler way of looking at the world than seeing the world as a, an area of, of an increasing number of people, soon to be probably 10 billion, um, where it's not clear how anybody fits in, in with anybody else. Um, so, uh, apart from India, um, you can uh, see the same, similar things going on in other places, like the One China policy. Um, one wonders sometimes whether North Korea isn't motivated partly by the same problem. Um, there have been increasing uh, numbers of uh, situations in Europe where national identities are not uh, uh, in conflict with local identities. It started with Belgium in the 70s. Um, and uh, Africa, of course, where the whole idea is uh, very new, um, has probably the biggest problems in, in countries like uh, the Congo. So um, I think what we're watching in India is, is the beginning of something that's happening in other places. And then very interestingly, last night there was a, a concert performance of a famous um, uh, musician from India in London, uh, whose name is Muslim. Um, I, it's Rahman, I think. I can't remember what the whole name is. And he sings both in Hindi and in Tamil. And halfway through the concert, half the pop, half of the uh, I, uh, the the um, audience. audience, if not, I think more than half of the audience, got up, turned their backs, and walked out. Even though he's an extremely popular musician, and the reason that was given afterwards in the social media discussion that developed was that he sang too many t uh, Telugu songs or Tamil songs, and <laughs> not enough Hindus Hindi songs, and they were all hit, went there for the Hindi songs. Mm. So I mean, th th this has been a problem in India ever since 1947, that, that uh, English was the language under the British and English is still the language which is the, the national, uh, for most national um, um, uh, interaction, but, but nevertheless on a more local level, there's this struggle against whose language is more important than which other languages. Well, but let me ask you, I mean, what, what we have seen in the past is uh, strong leaders frequently seek to adopt this national identity as part of the tool of their uh, uh, their subjugation efforts, if you will, of their country. And you would agree with that, right? Yeah. All right. Now, I would think that perhaps certainly subjugation might be too strong a word with Modi. But let's face it. I mean, we're talking about India with how many different languages, how many different ethnic groups. I mean, it's, it's a really, really different place. So some method, if it's Hindu, if it's Muslim, uh, if it's Buddhist, some method that is going to serve to, to sort of wheel together all of that and move it in a direction of economic prosperity. I mean, that would be a very helpful tool for any serious leader, I would think. 
but the 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 um, um, strange part of this is that what got Modi elected was his promise to um, focus on development and improve the economy, and he's done nothing, none of that. Uh, it's all been um, focused on the on the on Hindutva, and um, uh, one would have thought that that would make him unpopular now, mm -hmm. but it seems to have made him more popular with the Hindu majority. Um, and they've forgotten about the fact that they wanted um, development in the first place. Well, let me ask you another question. Um, Muslim uprising and riots are not foreign events in India. I mean, we, we know that hundreds and hundreds of, of people have, have been killed in, in just the past 10 years that I could think of in a substantial Muslim uprising in Gujarat. So, uh, and I mean, there's been special problems in Modi's own district in Gujarat. Correct. So, I mean, where where is the outrage, so to speak? Why is it being muted? Um, well, I think that uh, the, the um, Muslims are feeling more and more at a disadvantage and um, uh, losing hope and not protesting. Um, and uh, I actually have a number of uh, of. Uh, interesting Muslim friends in India, but I haven't been able to contact them and find out uh, what they think about what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to hear what their what their thoughts are, um, because even I've noticed it from here that there does seem to be a bit of a Hindu nationalism that um, it's, it's sort of a top down kind of Hindu nationalism, isn't it? It's almost as if uh, since the time of the British and certainly since the British left, there's, there's been a sort of effort to secularize the country you know, and everybody sort of pays lip service to it and recognizes it and understands that really it's the only way to manage such a, a diverse society as that. But since Modi has come to the fore now, it seems as if there is almost an unofficial kind of emphasis on uh, the Hindu majority and this is the way it's going to be or the highway is the alternative, so to speak. And another thing I learned was that the, the largest state in India, which is Uttar Pradesh, um, it's um, the, whatever the head political position is called, governor, or I'm not sure what it is, uh, is a, uh, a Hindu priest wearing a saffron robe and not very well educated. Um, I mean, this is, it's become this, uh, the, the visibility of what's going on has become this uh, d d exaggerated to this degree. Well, I, I, I don't understand why uh, uh, everything is so quiet then. Um, <laughs> well, it, I wonder um, how much is uh, going on that doesn't get reported simply because of the Western media not necessarily interested in it. But another part of this, which is interesting, I think, is that um, what's going on in our part of the world is um, uh, churches emptying out and uh, religious buildings falling down and so on. And generally, we're seeing uh, religion, which was so important in identity uh, up until um, the 20th century, now having no uh, real significance at all in large parts of the world. And yet in a place like India, it seems to be gathering significance. Now, does that mean that uh, the rate of social change has been, uh, ha had been retarded before this century um, and is now catching up? And it's going to be a while now before people, see, people in India cease to be interested in religion. Um, I mean, this is the sort of thing, looking at it from a global perspective that one would expect, but of course, there's no way of predicting how long that's going to take. Um, so, uh, the, um, uh, we're, we're also waiting for interest in Islam to uh, become less significant in Muslim countries. And it's beginning to happen, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the more urban Muslim countries like Iran. Um, 
and and so uh, I I would uh, I mean, religion has been such an important part of historical identity that um, I would imagine that this is uh, part of the larger global process. So what may happen is eventually uh, this this kind of uh, religious nationalism ultimately could atrophy. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so uh, and. Um, I mean, we've always said that globalization um, is a long-term process, and Very long uh, <laughs> a lot of things happen that aren't so good, as well as other things that are so good. And of course, the most important thing is more human minds coming together in interaction with each other, and a higher degree of collective learning, which inc increases our ability to innovate and do more interesting things. Um, and uh, to some extent, Hindutva is producing that. That is, uh, it's bringing together all the Hindus of this large country in a way that they were never brought together before. Uh, but it's going to take some time before uh, we get beyond that stage and it opens up into bringing in all the people who uh, had not been classified as Hindus. Uh, and and uh, maybe they'll themselves realize that Hinduism was a British idea in the first place. <laughs> so it's going to be very interesting to watch it unfold, that's for sure. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Schmoder. We'll uh, look forward to our next conversation. Good.